No, I'm not Randy. But uh, I, I, I do not mind being compared to Randy. Uh, so I'll tell you this. Um, I, I love coming here. I mean, I really do. I was walking up this morning from, uh, from my parking spot way in the back, and, and I was just, you know, walking around. I see Bernie and Mary Dell pulling in, and, and I just think, I said, man, I, this is the highlight of my week. I mean, not only do I not have to listen to me, um, so that makes things even better, but, I, I mean, th- just being around all you guys, I just, I love it. And it really is something I look forward to every week at work. I'm, I look forward to being here. I'm happy when I'm here. I get to see all the people I love and, and you know, cut up with and, and all that. It just is a, it, it's a, I, I love being here. And so I'm walking up this morning, uh, and you know, backpack on, my sunglasses, and walking around the corner, and what do I see? But I see my good friend, Randy Reagan, standing there in probably the best looking shirt I've seen in forever, and I'm like, what? And, and so, but the rest of that story is this, that Jill shared with me, is like Randy was going to, he was getting dressed this morning. And he's like, oh, I can't wear a cardinal shirt. You know, I got to wear, you know, I don't want to draw attention to anything but God. And then when the preacher shows up in the exact same shirt, he's like, ah, it's a sign, right? Yeah, it's a sign that all my laundry's dirty. That's the sign right there. But, uh, you know, that is biblical. Where two or more come together on anything the Lord is in that. So the Lord is in our wardrobe this morning, right? But no, I just, I, I honestly, walking in this morning, I think, man, I, I just, I love being here. And I hope you feel the same way. I hope you feel that, that you look forward to being here for, you know, not because we get to check off our, uh, you know, our, our religious duty for the week, but, but that you have real relationships with each other. I mean, I, like, I, like uh, uh, Mark Rollo this morning, I was able to tell him, I was able to confess to him, I'm not real happy with him, I'm not, real, I'm not talking to him right now, because he just got back from a Hawaiian vacation that I was not invited on. And neither, neither of you were either, so we are shunning him for the time being. But it's just, I mean, having, having us in, our, in each other's lives, I mean, I love cutting up with Ken. You know, he's obviously super old, and so I was walking to the back. I was looking at my communion, and I had, I inadvertently grabbed an easy open communion uh, thing. So I went back there. I said, I can't be having this. You know, I can't be using up an easy open uh, communion cup. So I go to the back to exchange it, and there's Ken, and I'm talking to him. I'm like, ha ha, giving you a hard time about this, that, and the other. And he says, all right, you little whippersnapper, whatever. Give me two of those easy opens. But, I mean, it's just a breath of fresh air being here. Used that earlier today, talking about it. It's just, I love being with my people. And I hope you feel the same way. And one of the reasons is because, like what Randy was talking about in his communion meditation, is that the the world is against us. And not just us, I mean everybody. This whole place, this whole world is, uh, is set up to be against people it's just it's broken nobody gets out of here alive i mean it's just there's all kinds of issues and problems and and perils around every corner but it's great to have a group of people that support you and laugh with you and cry with you and pray for you and so that's what we're going to do right now not laugh and cry but we're going to pray one of the things we found out this week our brother uh leslie had a uh you know leslie parks he you know Took a nosedive off of a set of bleachers, bumped his head, and uh, and you know, went to the doctor. Now, when you saw the CT, you saw the Facebook post. You read they did a CT scan, found nothing. Not surprising. Uh, and I love that he said they found nothing. Well, they found a brain, but they didn't find any injury. But then we had an MRI, and there's some there's a little bit of blood on his brain. So, uh, so we're gonna pray for our brother Leslie, uh, and 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 we know. We know that, that this is nothing. 
We, we know that, that, that this is nothing. God's going to see him through this with, with nothing more than just a few headaches. But even if he doesn't, Leslie will serve the Lord. That is, that's what we do. That is the beauty of why we're here. There's just more to it than, than obeying all the rules and, 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 uh, you know, and singing all the songs and reading all the scriptures. There's more to it than that. We're here because we know that no matter what this world throws at us, we've already overcome. So for our brother Leslie, we're all going to stand together and we're going to pray to God and we're going to take his name to the King of Kings right now. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you right now on our feet with hands lifted to you, recognizing that we have nothing in our hands to offer you, but Father, you have everything that you offer us. Father, our brother Leslie had an accident uh, earlier last week, and, and, uh, and we know that you are intimately aware with all of the struggles, all of the pains, all of the, the, the circumstances of that. And we ask you now that you would heal our brother, that you would comfort him in his, uh, in his discomfort. But Father, more than anything, that, that you would show the world and everyone who knows him your power through this. Father, we thank you for giving us redemption, giving us a hope and a future. Even though we stumble and fall, and sometimes we fall off of bleachers and bump our head, and Father, we pray, uh, we, we pray a, a prayer of thanksgiving that no matter what happens to us, we know that we are always in your loving arms. And it's in Jesus' holy and precious name I pray. Amen. Be seated, please. So this morning, we are continuing with our Easter sermon. Easter was weeks ago. But guess what? Thank you. What is he? He is still risen. Our God is still alive. Our God is still active. Our God is still powerful, as powerful today as he was three weeks ago when we celebrated the resurrection and, and we talk about how this image, this idea, this, uh, this historical event changes everything. But only if we will let it. Only if it is real. Only if we know that this is what is in store for each one of us. And so in a world that's constantly changing, our, uh, uh, you know, the, what, what I'm trying to, to, to get us to remember on a weekly basis is that the story keeps changing. Not the facts, not the, you know, not the, the, uh, the circumstances, none of that, but the, the, the power of the story of Jesus Christ keeps changing us. And it keeps changing. It just keeps rescuing us over and over. It keeps freeing us over and over. Just as soon as we think there's something that, that we're about to experience that, that, that is going to just put us in the ditch, that's just going to uh, you know, put us you know, out of, spinning out of control, the truth about Jesus frees us and rescues us from all the issues that we experience. And this morning I want to talk about a specific change that that Jesus makes that a specific issue that we all struggle with that Jesus rescues us from our pride you see because you know I can stand up here and, and as I've said before that you know sermons to me is just the uh, it's a you know we are involved in an on a week-to-week -week ongoing conversation and and this does not stand alone and last week's didn't and, and next week's won't either and as we talk about all of the things that we are to be and to do, I never want to present the, the, you know, what God wants from us as requirements or, you know, we got to get this right and we got to get that right. Because what happens is, is that we have all of these things that, that, that trip us up, right? Personality traits, just blatant sin addictions, whatever it is, things that trip us up and, and cause us to get away from God. And pride is, is one of the number one things that does that. 
pride, our pride is one of the things that, that pulls us away from God. Not, not intentionally, but, but so often unintentionally. And so what I want to do is, is go kind of back and talk about a story and we're inadvertently sort of talking about this Exodus story. I didn't, I didn't mean to, to get on the, the, you know, this Exodus bandwagon over the last few weeks, but it just fits so well with what I'm, what I'm trying to accomplish here is, is following the freeing process that ultimately resulted in the freedom of God's people, but there were steps along the way. And, and so this morning, I want to talk about being rescued from this sin that is pride. Pride is a prison where you are both the inmate and the warden. Pride is a, is, is a, is a personality trait or a, 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 a stumbling block that we get involved in, that, that we allow to overtake us, that, that, we are, that we are imprisoned by and also in control of. I'll give you a, uh, an example. We are paralyzed by what other people think. We're paralyzed by, by what uh, the world constantly thinks or what we think of ourselves. And what God is trying to do is get us to understand that it doesn't matter what you think of me, or it doesn't really matter what I think of me, it only matters what... No. No. I'll give you a cheat sheet for two weeks from now. It doesn't matter what you think of me, it doesn't matter what I think of me. It only matters, and it doesn't matter what God thinks of me, because I can't, I can't change that, I can't do anything about that. God loves me no matter what. I mean, think about that right now. God loves you more than you will ever know. There's nothing that you can do to make God love you any more than he loves you right now. And there's nothing you can stop doing to make God love you any more than he loves you right now. I mean, there's no sin that you're involved in or that I'm involved in that we can put away, that we can overcome, and God say, oh, I'm so proud. Now, you know, I've got so much more love for them. Now, there are things that pull us away from him, doesn't pull him away from us, pulls us away from him. So it doesn't matter what you think of me, it doesn't matter what I think of you, it only matters what we think of God. That's, that's where we get to. So we're going to look through that, we're, and that's, going to, that's really going to come out in two more weeks about what, how we envision God. But pride is this prison because we are overcome by what people think of us, what we think of ourselves, what, and all these things. Here's a case in point. Anybody ever heard of Rick Barry, basketball player back in like the 60s? It's 1960s, not the 1860s. 19, something like that. And, and so, and he was a prolific free throw shooter and if, if I was a really uh, good preacher I'd have a video of it I don't but imagine a guy standing at the free throw line in an NBA uniform in an NBA arena with NBA uh, you know national bas pro basketball players at the free throw line he gets the ball and he shoots it like this the granny shot right he shot like 90 something percent over a career discover magazine in like 2010 i believe did a uh, got a bunch of physicists together and others to study the shot and they said that because of the the launch angle and the backspin and how it softly hit the rim and all that it was the optimal way to shoot free throws it, it was the it was hands down the most consistent and the best way to do it one guy did it. Now, there's other basketball players. One comes to mind. Everybody's heard of Wilt Chamberlain, right? Wilt Chamberlain was a horrific free throw shooter. I mean, he was, he was, the, he was Shaq before Shaq was Shaq. And if you know anything about basketball, Shaq can't shoot a free throw. It, it's like if, if you know, Shaq bought a big boat, because you know, a big yacht, and they said, you should name that free throws because you can't sink them. The SS free throw, because Shaq, you cannot sink that. Well, one game in particular, Wilt Chamberlain was trying to get, get his free throws on, and one game, Wilt Chamberlain scored over 100 point, uh, scored 100 points in one game. One game. You can look it up on the internet, I promise you. 
when there's a picture of him holding up a little sign where he wrote 100, scored 100 points. He was the worst free throw shooter in the world, but that game, he went 28 for 32 from the line. And you know why? He tried the granny shot one game. Took him from a terrible free throw shooter to a great free throw shooter, and that's the only time he did it because he told the reporters that he felt silly. Right? He felt, he said, oh, it, looks, it looks silly. Other people, other players were giving him a hard time about it. So he never tried it again. Went back to free throw terrible. What, what, you know, went back to just not being able to, to sink in. All it takes is, is just one change. To go from the worst to one of the best. But, but he wouldn't do it. And nobody else in NBA history has, has done that uh, consistently because they just feel like it just looks silly. And what are people going to think? And it's going to make me look silly. And I can't have that. Regardless of the performance. But we're captivated by our pride. We're imprisoned by our pride. And we allow our pride to keep us from the life that God has in store for us. Because of our pride. So I want to show, I want to uh, look at, at a, a couple of verses in Exodus. Uh, if you've got your Bibles, turn with me over to, uh, uh, to Exodus chapter 2. Now remember we talked about, uh, for the last couple of weeks we talked about the uh, uh, um, you know the Egyptians or the Israelites being held captive. They're they're uh, 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 they're, they're slaves in Egypt. We talked about the uh, the midwives who who thwarted God's pl- or thwarted Pharaoh's plan. We talked about uh, uh, Amram and Jochebed last week thwarting uh, Pharaoh's plan. And now we see kind of a, a an in the middle episode of God's plan coming to fruition. And so. Remember, the, 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 the star of this, of this story, or the, the main character of this story, uh, Moses, born in one of the worst infanticides in, in the history of, of the world, and his mother puts him in a basket. Pharaoh's daughter finds him, puts him in a basket, puts him in the Nile. Pharaoh's daughter finds him, brings him, raises him, in the palace, raises him in, in, as Egyptian royalty. So we're going to look at, at one more episode of, of, this, of, of this experience to see how, how pride keeps us from God's will. Verse 11, one day after Moses had grown up, now remember, he grew up being educated in the palace, educated as an Egyptian, taking care of, I mean, he was Egyptian royalty. His grandfather, Pharaoh, the most powerful person on earth at the time. Anything Pharaoh wanted, Pharaoh got. Anything Pharaoh wanted to do, Pharaoh did. Anything Pharaoh wanted anyone else not to do, they didn't do. And anything he wanted them to do, you did it or you died. That's his grandpa. Okay? I mean, just painting the picture there. Getting, getting an idea of what this, this guy's life was like growing up. So one day after he'd grown up, he went to where his own people were and he watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people, glancing this way and that, seeing no one. He killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. The next day he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one that was in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me the way you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, what I've done must have become known. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian, where he sat down at a well. Now a priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came to draw water to fill the troughs to water their father's flock. Some shepherds came along and drove them away, but Moses got up and came to their rescue and watered their flock. When the girls returned to to rule their father, he asked, why have you returned so early today? They answered, an Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds. He even drew water for us and watered the flock. And where is he, he asked his daughters. Why did you leave him? Invite him to have something to eat. 
Moses agreed to stay with the man who gave his daughter, Zipporah, to Moses in marriage. Zipporah gave birth to a son, and Moses named him Gershom, saying, I have become an alien in a foreign land. During that long period, the king of Egypt died, and the Israelites groaned in their slavery, cried out in their cry because of their slavery, went up to God. and they cried out for help because of their slavery, and that went up to God. A couple of points I want to make really quickly. As we realize the, the position, the situation that we're all in, and that is that there are aspects of this life that we have to be delivered, we have to be rescued from if we're ever going to experience the true freedom, and that's where this sermon series has originated and is going. If we're ever going to experience the true freedom that exists in God, there are things that we have to come out of. And one of those is the prison of pride. So the first thing that I want to look at is that pride, our pride results in epic failures. Did you see how this, how this episode started? First of all, Moses is being raised in the, in the palace. But he's being raised in the palace by his own mother. Remember, she's the one who gets to nurse him and, and, and God works it out to where she gets paid to do what she really wanted to do all along. And that was to take care of her own son. And somehow, in those first few years, Moses was so uh, inundated with the stories of God and the, the God of his father and his, of his father's people and, all, and his father's father that, that that stuck with him all the way through his life. And he gets to this point where he sees some of his countrymen, some of his own people being beaten, being abused by an Egyptian. And scripturally, we never see God tell Moses that he is the rescuer of his people, do we? That comes later at the burning bush. There's no, there, there's no place so far that, that we ever see Moses talking with anyone, his parents. But so how does he think that he's supposed to be the deliverer, the rescuer of his people? Because we can deduce that that's exactly what he was trying to do. Moses is trying to jumpstart a rebellion against Egypt by the Hebrews by pointing himself out as the rescuer, the deliverer. And we know this because Pharaoh starts pursuing him. Now Moses is royalty. I mean, he's the, he is the grandson of Pharaoh. He could kill an Egyptian commoner anytime he wanted to for any reason except for this reason because the reason that Moses is doing this is like I said to jumpstart rebellion it's an act of treason Pharaoh knows that so he's trying to eliminate the threat once again you see Moses he looks the, you know, the Bible says he looks this way and that other translations say he looked to the left he looked to the right and you've heard the story, you've heard the example so many times. You know, Moses looked to the left and looked to the right, but he didn't look up. Well, he might have. He might have looked up as well, but because we do that too, don't we? Some of the, sometimes we, you know, Moses is convinced that he's the one who will rescue his people. And this is what happens when you try to read the tea leaves even. I mean, how many times have you been told, Oh, God has set you up for such greatness. God's put you in a place. How do you know that, you, that God has not brought you for such, to this place for such a time as this? I mean, ladies, how many times have we studied Esther? Because that, that's the typical lady study, right? Esther. Great story. Love it. I preach sermon after sermon about it. But we say that, don't we? How, I mean, God's brought you here for such a time as this. We can look to the left and we can look to the right. We can even look up and we can say, read all the tea leaves and all of the circumstances come together. And we think, this is God's will for me. And so I'm going to go out and do it. And that's exactly what Moses did. I mean, that's exactly what Abraham did, isn't it? Abraham's like, well, God's will for me is to have a child. And Sarah obviously can't, so what am I going to do? I'm going to take this handmaid, and I'm going to have a baby with her. And that's what he did. But Ishmael was born, and he never had the anointing of God. Because our pride delivers nothing but epic fails. 
I mean, no doubt, he, his mother, his father, others in his circle told him how obviously ordained to rescue the children of Israel out of bondage. You're in a great position to be a great leader. So guess what? One of my favorite things, Moses had to do something. Remember, we talked about that. You know how politicians they run for office, and they know they ju- they know they just got to do something. I wish they would stop doing anything. Just leave us alone. Let us go to work. Let us you know. But but no, we all feel oh I got to do something. Well, sometimes the something is nothing, and wait on God to do what God does. But so often we get impetuous. We get impatient. And we know, I, I know, I, I've, just, I've, I've got all these talents, I've got all this skill, I've got this opportunity, and so I act. And what happens? It turns into an absolute dumpster fire. Not only does what Moses do not jumpstart a rebellion, but it does the exact opposite. What it does is it pits the, the, uh, uh, the, the Hebrews against him because they're like, you know, what are you going to do? You're going to kill me like you did them? Who made you ruler over us? Who made you judge and jury? And it also got him out of the favor of Pharaoh, and so now he's being pursued, and he has to go to Midian. And our pride results in epic failure because pride removes God from his will. There's no doubt that Moses was the chosen one of God to lead his people out of this oppression. But God is not obligated to do anything. And especially, and I want to say this correctly the way, and God is especially not obligated to bless any effort that robs him of the glory that he is due. Let me say that one more time. First of all, God's not obligated to do anything that we say or think. We, we do not have some kind of leverage over God. No matter how obedient to the words in here, no matter how many you know, spiritual experiences or religious anything we accomplish, God is not obligated to do anything on our behalf. Especially not obligated to do anything or bless any effort that robs him of his own glory. You see, if Moses' plan would have been successful, guess what would have happened? The people would be following and praising Moses, not God. Because if, if Moses in his own strength, in his own idea, in his own every, I mean, and we see that happen all the time, don't we? We see the, the one who, who comes and with the great plan and, 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 all, and they're the ones who are lifted up. What a great leader. What a great person. What a great whatever they are. What, you know, what a great president. What a great representative. You know, what a great preacher. What a great pastor. All the, and, and, and God is sitting up. He's the one who has the plan. But we're so willing to give others the glory or take that for ourselves. And God's not, God's not sharing that. And if Moses' plan to, to get the rebellion going that way would have robbed God of his glory, David understood this. Moses is about to learn that. David understood this. Remember when, when uh, uh, Saul is pursuing David? And David goes into this cave to relieve himself, and, there's Saul, and his men say, hey, here, here's your chance. There's Saul. He's sleeping. He, you know, Saul's trying to kill him. Saul's pursuing him. And his men say, David, here's your chance to kill him. And David says, look, I will not reach out my hand against God's anointed. They said, David, it, it, you, know, you can kill Saul, and then you can be king. God's already anointed him as king. It, God, David's already going to be king. And, and, and he's not going to make that happen any quicker or in any other circumstances other than what God has chosen. Don't make yourself, Jesus understood that. Remember when all the people came to him? and they, I mean, a multitude of people came to Jesus and they were ready to make him king. Jesus was already a king. You're not going to make him king. He's already a king. So many times, God's not going to bless efforts 
even if they're his will that, are, that happen outside of, of his way. It's never, it, it's never okay to do God's will in our way. It's always God's will to do his will in his way. And it's our responsibility, it's our opportunity, it's our privilege to learn that so that we can be in his will. So not only does pride result in epic failure, but it removes God from his will. But the good news is, is that the wilderness affords an opportunity to learn humility. Because there's this phrase that goes all throughout Scripture. It's twice in the Old Testament, or twice in the New Testament, and, and you find it in about 12 times in the Old Testament. And this phrase is, is that God opposes the proud, but he lifts up the humble. Or he gives grace to the humble. Or he exalts the humble, whatever version or translation you're looking at or, or in some places it's a little bit different and that word oppose is is a greek word or in 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 hebrew uh it's a little bit different but in greek it's, it's literally the same word that's used of generals lining up their their uh, forces for battle so when we act in our pride we're literally opposing god we're, we're literally opposing, we're lining up in opposition to God. But the wilderness, there, there's, this, there's this great place that God sends his leaders, his workers, his, uh, his servants to learn his ways, and it's called the wilderness. And I love the way that, that he explains this. When Moses, when, when Moses encounters uh, these ladies, they go in, and they go back home. How did they describe him? They said, when, when uh, Ruel, their father, asked them what happened, they said, an Egyptian. They didn't use his name. They said, an Egyptian. Everything about Moses screamed Egypt, screamed royalty, screamed prince. I mean, they, they knew. I mean, he was educated. He was clothed. He was adorned. Everything about him screamed Egypt. And when God brings him into the wilderness, he's about to strip all of that away from him. So that the only thing that Moses screams from his appearance or his, his demeanor is God. You see, this is where we truly see the power of God to rescue this is where we truly see where we relate to this story. Because before Moses could rescue anyone, he himself had to be rescued. Unfortunately, when he was in Egypt, he didn't know that. So God had to put him in a place where he would realize just how in need of rescue he was. So God sends him to Midian and, and Moses gets a, a, a very quick and in-depth introduction to the study of humility. Look at what he names his, his child in Exodus 2 and 22. Gershom, I have become a foreigner in a foreign land. The first thing God does is make Moses a shepherd. And if you remember back in Genesis, the reason that the, the Hebrews lived separate from the Egyptians is because that's what they were. They were shepherds. They were, uh, they were herdsmen. And the Egyptians thought nothing was more disgusting than livestock. And anyone who was a shepherd or, 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 or had livestock, I mean, they were, they were the lowest of the low. They were untouchable. They were, you know, that's why in, in, uh, uh, when Jesus was born, the shepherds were living out in the fields with their flocks. So they, they really weren't welcome anywhere else. They were, they were the outcast, the untouchable. So first thing God does is make him a shepherd. He had grown up his whole life hearing, you're too good for sheep. Now the second thing God does is make him a dad. And everybody, if you've had children, nothing humbles you quicker than becoming a parent. Two things. Sheep and babies treat no one like a prince i mean it doesn't matter if you know who you are you could be the most 
uh, accomplished and prolific worship leader in the world, and a baby is going to cry in your face during your, your birthday dinner. Ask Scott to tell you that story. That's his favorite Hyatt Hines story right there. We were having dinner. It was Scott's birthday. Hyatt cried all the way through it. Scott tried to hold him. He wouldn't stop crying. Now, and, now this was like, what, three years ago when this happened? Babies and sheep treat nobody special. Moses is about to get a crash course in what it means to be humble. Before he was to rescue anyone, he needed to be rescued from his pride. And this is where becoming like Jesus really gets its meaning for us. Because until we are at God's mercy, we will never experience freedom or deliverance. We will never be rescued. See, this is getting down into the theological and ex experiential weeds of the whole thing. This is why when we say, I want to know Christ and him crucified, this is why Moses is in the wilderness experience so that all he can depend on is God. God is trying to get us to a point where any success we have, any joy we have, any... Uh, uh, any, anything good that we have or accomplish, He is the only reason. God's trying to get us, each one of us, all Christians everywhere, to the point where we know that any good thing, any good deed, anything good, He is the only explanation in our life. That's why we say, I want to know Christ and Him crucified. What's more dependent What's more uh, at your mercy than being dead on his terms so that he can bring us forth from the grave? That's the experiencing Jesus and him crucified moment that we are all searching for. This kind of Midian experience to where, hey, on my own, I look impressive, but with God, I'm just along for the ride. I mean, think about Jesus. 100% God, right? But 100% man. 100% human. I, I know it, it's hard to wrap our mind around that. But the 100% human part of him lays every bit of that humanity in God's hands. And what happens? A lot, a lot of good things. A lot of bad things. All the good things, he gives the glory to God. Because as a human, as a human, he's not able to do any of those things. But with the power of God's Holy Spirit, he's able to do all kinds of miraculous feats, right? And as a human, all he can do is submit to death. Yes, even death on a cross. What Hyatt read earlier. And then go into a tomb. But it's the power of God that brings him out of that. You see, it's when we are at such a point where only God can be, can, can be blamed for the things that, that we accomplish. Is when we experience the freedom that that empty tomb offers. That's the... I want to know Christ and him crucified. That, that's what Moses is going through. He's going through that, that, that death, burial, and resurrection that, that we go through, that we, that we should be going through. So that on the other side of that, only God is to be depended on. O only God is to be trusted. Only God is to be relied on. Only God is to be called on. Only God is to be glorified for what just happened or what's about to happen. Until we are at God's mercy, we never experience freedom. We never experience rescue. Because the wilderness affords an opportunity to learn humility because God's grace rescues us from our pride. That's what 1 Peter 5, uh, 1 Peter 5, 5 through 6, if you've got your Bibles, you can look over and underline it because it's an important one to underline. First Peter 5, okay. 
He says, young men, in the same way, be submissive to those who are older. It's hard to be submissive and be full of pride. All of you, clothe yourself with humility towards one another. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So therefore, humble yourselves under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So what do we do? We put ourselves in a position to need God to do what only God can do. Resurrecting the dead, I feel like, is probably the ultimate example of God doing what only God can do. And we will never experience that until we humble ourselves, until we allow for God's will to be done in God's way so that the result, only he can get the glory. How often do we find ourselves trying to trying to do God's will in our own strength? Trying to, to read the tea leaves, as it were, and, and do God's will in our timing. You see, a lot of times, God calls us to wait. Wait for what? We'll wait for him. But sometimes, just, just, just to wait. Remember we started at the very beginning of the year, just be still and know. Think about all of those Hebrews who, who grew up and lived and died in captivity. You think they were waiting? Sure. How does their life bring glory to God? I mean, they lived their whole lives oppressed. They lived their whole lives as slaves. They lived their whole lives saying, God will rescue us. Sometimes waiting and not being rescued is rescue enough. What do you, what do you mean by that? I'm glad you asked. And I'll end with this. Because when we're waiting on God, regardless of how or if or if we can see him show up, if we're waiting on God, we believe, he, we, we believe in him. I, I mean, I can't make it any more simple. I wish I had fancy college -y words to make that sound smart, but if we're waiting on him, we believe in him. And guess what other people can see? They can see us sitting still, believing in God. And regardless of our circumstances, I mean, there's power in what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say. There's power in what Daniel says. God can deliver us, but even if he doesn't, I'm just going to sit here, and I'm just going to wait on him anyway. Because he's real. And... Until people believe God can do mighty things, you first got to believe he's real. And until we can accomplish mighty things for God, sometimes we just have to wait, prove to ourselves and others that we really think he's real. We really know he's real. And waiting for him to show up, even in the worst circumstances, even in the worst conditions, even where, where, where death might be imminent. Okay. Because some people live lives of outstanding accomplishments and, and, and great notoriety on God's behalf. But for the most part, the rest of us are like those Hebrew slaves that just died in obscurity waiting on God, but gloriously peacefully, joyously waiting on the true and living God. God offers us the wilderness to humble us. And when we are humbled, and when we live that life waiting on God, is when we are truly free, and not until. What's our last song we're about to sing? 
I really don't have anything other to say than let's sing Amazing Grace together. Would you please stand as together we sing?